I hope uh, this is a fun topic for you, even if you're not religious. Okay? You don't have to be religious to uh, enjoy a topic on religion. Okay? Uh, I start uh, today's class with uh, a few quotes. Uh, by now you know that I, this is sort of a pattern, right? Uh, anyway, uh, have you heard of this uh, quote before? God is dead. And who said it? Uh, this was uh, Nietzsche said it. And uh, if you just read that, it's not fun. Why? You have to try to understand the context in which this was said. And you know what the, what the context is? This was said in response to the sort of the the sort of dominance of Enlightenment philosophy. What I mean by this, what I mean by the dominance of Enlightenment philosophy is this. Before the advent of Enlightenment philosophy, what dominated Europe was what? Church, Church and religion. But with the Enlightenment, what became more dominant was scientific rationality. So instead of using religious ideas or using God as the basis of everything, now it was science. And this is when, I'm talking about the Enlight Enlightenment period, you know, like a uh, philosopher like Descartes. He's famous for saying things like, I shop, therefore I am. I'm just kidding. I, I think he said, I think, therefore I am, right? And, was, and also that uh, apple guy, my favorite apple guy, Newton, right? Somehow sat on, under an under apple tree and somehow apple hit him and we found gravity, right? Anyway, so that's, that's why, again, if you just read that and without looking into the context, it doesn't really make much sense, right? And then, this came along. This is also a very famous quote. Um, and if God is dead, is everything permitted? Or is everything permissible? And this is not really related to uh, the Enlightenment period, but uh, this was said by Dostoevsky. And the reason why he said it was, if God is dead, uh, is morality also dead? Because in, in most religions, who, who, who has the authority over morality? It's God, right? Usually, God said this, God said don't do that, right? And if God is dead, isn't everything permissible? You can just, you know, there's no right and wrong. And that's the idea behind this. Uh, but something more... Uh, this is something I read when I was in uh, university. It was so powerful that I uh, sort of kept it with me in my heart. Isn't this a really a powerful quote about religion? And who said this? Of course, if you don't know, you don't know, right? <laughs> Who's uh, Jonathan Swift? He wrote uh, Gulliver Travels, right? Uh, anyway, uh, just I have to read this. Um, we have just enough religion, religion to make us hate, but not enough to make us love one another. Guys, take this to your heart and love, no matter what your religion is. Um, my last quote is this, uh, this is my simple religion. There is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy. Our own brain, our own heart is our temple. And that is the philosophy of kindness. That is religion for the Dalai Lama. Okay? Uh, anyway. I want you to think about these questions, not, not you know, necessarily right now, but um, in, uh, in your free time. 
Okay. Did you ever wonder like what the origins of religion are? Like how did it all begin? Again, if you are interested in this, be active, meaning type origin of religion in your on your computer and you'll get some really nice answers to this question, right? And um, why are people religious? This is another very basic question, but if you don't really sort of study it, uh, meaning, you know, at least the reading a, a, a sort of a Wikipedia entry on it, you probably have a very basic rudimentary ideas, but maybe you would want to go beyond that, right? And third is, uh, what are the functions of, uh, and dysfunctions of religion? Okay. Uh, next one, which I'll uh, also have in your discussion questions. We'll, so we'll have a discussion period uh, today. Last one, sorry to say. Should religion be concerned with social, cultural, and political issues? Okay. And last one. What do you think about the argument that religion is uh, an opium of the masses? And this is said by Marx, uh, whether you agree with this or not. It's uh, a really uh, interesting uh, question for uh, debate, right? Uh, I cut this from, uh, from the internet, but it's so uh, funny, right? Oh, it's not funny? <laughs> and which back basket has the largest amount of money? At least from this picture, atheist. You know, you see that? Right? <laughs> Again, at least in this picture. And next is agnostic. So, similar there, right? Um, since we're uh, talking about the topic of religion, I thought it's maybe nice to show you a timeline. So, I mean, of course, you don't really have to memorize these, but you, you should at least know, you know, what uh, religion is the oldest, uh, right? Like, in terms of world religion. World religion meaning religion that is sort of found in many parts of the world, or has a, a huge number of following. That would be a sort of a common sense uh, definition of world religion. Okay? And for example, Hinduism, you don't really find that religion popular in many parts of the world, but it has a huge following, right? So that's why it is designated as a, a world religion. Okay? All right? All right. So this is the uh, lecture outline. So. Uh, remember, uh, I think it was under family that I talked about theories of, you know, sociology, right? Uh, so I think this is my second time talking about uh, theories. Why? Because these two theories that we talked about uh, offer so much insights into what religion is for us. Okay? And then I provide a, a brief overview of uh, Korean religion. So it's sort of a religious history of Korea. And then uh, religious diversity in Korea. And fourth, rise of Christianity in Korea. Because Korea is uh, uh, only one of two countries in Asia where Christianity is a major religion. Okay? Uh, fourth, uh, fifth is a continuing influence of religion. So in many parts of the world, the influence of religion is declining. But in Korea, it's not really happening. Okay? Religion still has a very powerful presence. Last uh, discussion questions. Okay? First, theories of religion. And the first one is functionalist perspective of religion. Uh, if you recall, uh, functionalism argues that society is like an organism, right? Meaning, each part of society, like all these institutions, right? Like family, education, economy, religion, is interdependent 
and each contributes to society's stability and functioning as a whole. Okay? Uh, so, in regard to religion, the functionalist perspective stresses the functions that religion ser serves for society. So, as with any other institution, if we were talking about a f a f you know, education from a functionalist pr perspective, the, this particular perspective would look at the functions served by education. So, in the same vein, uh, perspective functionalist perspective on religion sort of looks at the functions served by religion. Okay? So my next uh, slide obviously asks this particular question. What are the functions of religion in, for society? Yes. Moral guidance. Moral guidance. Or social control. Same thing. Good. Thank you. Social, yes, social cohesion or social unity, right? Anything else? So we have two, social cohesion and social guidance slash control. Yes. Comfort, Comfort yes. Let's call it therapeutic function. Okay, so... At times of stress, at times of really uh, emotional uh, sort of uh, trauma, uh, like uh, when you know someone significant uh, in one's life gets sick or is dies, you look for comfort in religion. So religion serves that therapeutic function, right? So we have three, uh, and let's see what else we have. So. Uh, I say there are about five main functions of religion. One is provision of meaning. And, you know, religion provides, you know, what it means to be a, a, a human, what it means to uh, be a, a moral person or moralistic person, or uh, it tells you about what the truths are. It tells you what may sort of, be like after death, okay? So, something that science cannot tell us, it has all these interpretations and, and, and doctrines, right? So we call it provision of meaning, okay? It sort of gives meaning to many things that science cannot explain, okay? So that's first. Second is something that was mentioned already, social unity and stability. So religion provides people with a common set of beliefs and values. So religion functions as a form of uh, social cement. Okay. Third is social control, so moral guidance. Okay. So a good example from the uh, the Bible it, for Christianity is uh, Ten Commandments, right? Fourth is uh, something already mentioned, therapeutic function. Uh, it provides emotional support during major events of the life cycle. And it enhances psychological well-being. So studies have found that uh, religion does have this function where People who are religious are found to be happier and more satisfied with their lives than those who are not religious. Okay? So, uh, I guess uh, anyone who is religious in this room, meaning has an affiliation with a religious organization, he or she is bound to be happier, according to all the studies that I've seen. Uh, religiosity also... Uh, promotes better physical health and that is because many religions do teach right certain uh, types of behavior that encourage uh, the followers not to engage in heavy drinking or you know uh, drugs or 
uh, maybe even premarital sex, right? And some studies find that religious people tend to live longer than those who are not religious. Okay? So overall, if you look at, uh, if you sort of study like uh, relationship between religiosity and quality of life, study after study from all over the world shows that people who are religious have higher uh, quality of life. Okay? Last one, and, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know why I have five functions and only four? At the last minute, I deleted the fifth one. Okay? Um, so, sorry. The second uh, theory is uh, conflict theory. Does, it, does anyone remember what conflict theory is, is about? Not necessarily related to religion, but just in general. What does uh, conflict theory say? Yes. Very good. Very good. Excellent. What else can I say? Uh, so according to conflict perspective, uh, society comprises of all these different groups, all these, all these different interest groups who are vying for limited resources, which may be money, you know, power, whatever the, the case may be, right? And uh, conflict theory also argues that uh, power and resources in any given society are unequally distributed. That's agreeable, right? And the elite use their power to control the institutions of society to their advantage, to shape public policies and opinions to their advantage. Now, I don't, I don't know if there, are, if, if there is anybody who would disagree with this, or is there anybody who would disagree that this is not true? Is there any institution in which the elite does not, is not using to their advantage, except the family, of course? Uh, so I think this, you know, uh, statement is, you know, uh, to, safe to safely put, at least uh, valid, uh, right? So with that in mind, according to the conflict perspective on religion, uh, first, religion is a form of alienation. So, yes, we're talking about religion in Korea, but maybe this is sort of a, a lesson about uh, religion as a sort of what is religion and uh, this is actually uh, you know is what uh, Freud said about religion and also Marx why why is uh, why did these two men of course other philosophers said the same thing but why do you think that religion is said to be a form of alienation And if you haven't really thought about this issue, what I'm about to share with you, I think it'll leave a lasting impact on what you think about religion. Okay? Because if you don't think about it, you sort of take it as given. Okay? But this is why philosophers, psychologists, is, you know, again, the eminent ones would uh, include Freud and Marx have said this, right? Religion is a form of alienation because of this. Uh, who created gods? Humans. Our ancestors from the past. So, but it is, it is a form of alienation. It, it is alienating because we created gods, but we let God control us. And that's where the inconsistency comes in. Okay? Um, so, and of course, we lost control. We created religion or God, but somehow we lost control of it, and now religion controls us. That's, you know, very simply put. That's what uh, these uh, uh, thinkers have argued. Okay? So, religion is a form of alienation, 
And uh, next is religion legitimizes the existing social order. Now, okay, let's not talk about your own society. But you would agree that all over the world, in many countries, would you say that everything is just? Or there are many cases of injustice, whether it's economic inequality or uh, discrimination against women, discrimination, discrimination against certain ethnic groups, whatever the case may be. That happens, yes or no? Now, when those injustices are being, being carried out, did, in most countries, or if not every country, did the church, did the, the Buddhist organizations, or whatever the, the group, religious, dominant religious group is, did they oppose the, 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 the powerful elite group or did they just go along with them? And the answer is the latter, right? Uh, if, you, if you think that uh, there are so many poor people suffering in Africa, yes, there are churches, there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, Islamic groups uh, which are dominant in their own societies, but they're never on the side of the poor or the powerless. And that's what this uh, theory is, is arguing. That the dominant religion is always on the side of the, the powerful, the, 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 the group in power. Okay? So if we see injustices all over the world, it's not because of not enough religion. It's just a matter of religion taking sides with the powerful, okay? the, the small elite. Right? So, example would be, you know, so many, right? Um, like in India, you know, if you uh, know about caste system, uh, it's, it's now banned, but it's still, you know, still practiced uh, in, in India, right? Uh, the people belonging to the lowest caste cannot use the same bathroom as the the, uh, the elite group, right? And so uh, whenever I th think about the caste system, it's so disheartening that this is still happening in the 21st century. And what about the, the Hindu priest? Do they ever, Brahmins, do they ever like say, oh, for social justice, for equality, for humanity, we got to get rid of this. Do they ever do that? No. So that's a, a classic example of uh, religion sort of legitimizing the existing social order. Can you think of any other examples? I mentioned uh, Hinduism and the caste system. Anything else? Actually, you could mention almost every society, right? Because that's been the case. Third, uh, religion has been used by the elite as a tool of masking an underlying social conflict. Okay? Um, maybe I should have... Uh, this is more true uh, for historical instances, okay? not necessarily what is happening today. Okay? Uh, are you familiar with a uh, witch hunt that took place uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in, in the Middle Ages in Europe? Um, history records show that up to uh, 500,000 uh, supposedly witches were uh, executed, usually uh, by fire. And, you know, studies show that 85% of them were uh, women. And why? Okay? They were blamed for like causing hailstorms, crop failures, and sickness. But were they the, 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 the causes? The witches? Did they cause all these? So the answer is in this, right? Why? Europe at the time was in a state of deep economic, political, and social unrest at the time. Okay? So there were a lot of people starving. There were crop failures. And so by pointing fingers at 
these witch, so-called witches, they diverted, right, the blame from kings and priests to these helpless uh, uh, men and women. Okay. So religion has been used by the elite to divert the attention of the suffering masses to something else. Okay. And um, so the poor came to believe that they were being victimized by witches and devils instead of princes and popes. Okay? Now, I said that this is more true for certain historical cases rather than the present. But if you were to really dig deep, deep and find more contemporary example, do you, can you think of any example where religion was used to divert uh, people's attention from real problems? Or can you think of uh, something else that is, being, that is being used to divert people's attention from real problems? You know, it's not my saying, but uh, a lot of uh, scholars now argue that if religion was uh, something that uh, it, the elite used to divert people's attention from uh, real social problems, now sports is now taking that role. Because uh, when you're crazy about sports, you know, your teams you love and whatever the case may be, you're just so focused on it, it's like it becomes like your religion and nothing else matters. So as long as your sports team is in existence and it, it, it plays on a weekly basis, then everything is happy. So instead of uh, uh, really being active with social issues, political issues, so that your life is better, your focus is, is just solely on this opium. Okay? So religion is no longer the opium of the masses for a lot of people. It's sports. I don't know. So, so I see a lot of people sort of uh, nodding their heads as if they are themselves. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, well, who, who doesn't like sports? But uh, anyway, uh, this is a picture of uh, witches so-called witches. So this is the, uh, the part where, sort of re related to the, the previous slide, religion as opium of the masses. Of course, this was said by Marx. Uh, so religion has been used by the powerful to legitimize the st status quo. And the question is then, why aren't people trying to change this? Because the answer is, religion is like an opium. Why? Um, religion, like a drug, makes people content with their existing conditions. People think it's God's will that they are poor, either because he's testing their faith in him, or because they have violated his rules. You know, um, the church in Korea, that's the largest in the world, Yoido Full Gospel Church, the pastor there, as, as I sort of briefly mentioned before, preaches three blessings of Christ. Now, who is Christian in this room? Let me go over this again. Who is a Christian in this room? Okay, what's the 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 blessing of the Christ for becoming a Christian? Hmm? Pre? Oh, well, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're promised something, right? What is that promise? Yes. That's it, eternal life. But in Korea, and lucky we are Koreans, you, become, you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you get not only one blessing, which is eternal life, we get two more. You know what they are? Health and long life. Second. Third, 
you get rich. Prosperity. Wow, isn't it nice to become a Christian in this country? You not only get eternal life, but before you die, you live long, you live healthy, and you get all the money you want. Now, why did I bring this up? To make a point about this. Okay? So, let's say you're turned on by this uh, uh, sort of preach, right? The, the message of the sermon, that you become a Christian and God promises you all these, right? Now, after 10 years, 20 years of your devout Christian life, you're not getting rich. So you go to the, the preacher, right? The cho, cho, cho whatever, right? Hey, you know, I've been a devout Christian. I accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Why isn't, <laughs> where's my gold? Where's my Benz car or whatever, right? And guess what his answer is? You have, I'm sure, violated his rules. No, no, seriously, that's what, what, what he, he would, prob he would uh, typically say. And also, by not giving you the reward that you, you expect, he is still testing your faith. To that, what, what can you say? Right? Um, so anyway, uh, they believe that if they endure their suffering, they will reward it uh, in the afterlife. And this is also true uh, for uh, Indians, uh, who, East Indians, that is. So these views lead people not to blame the society for their poverty uh, and thus not to revolt, right? So that's uh, the point about uh, religion sort of being a, an opium of the masses. It makes people passive, okay? rather than uh, taking actions to change a uh, society that is so unjust to them, they accept things they are, okay? All right, so that was the uh, uh, theories uh, of religion from two perspectives, functionalist and uh, conflict perspective. Now we turn to Korean religion, uh, a brief uh, historical survey. And we start with um, shamanism, right? Uh, because from time immemorial, Koreans believed in shamanism. And um, later, uh, both Confucianism and Buddhism were into introduced to Korea from China during the Three Kingdom period. Okay? And the Three Kingdom period, uh, as you can see there, 57 BC to 668 AD. And that's the uh, uh, picture of uh, the Three Kingdom. So, I don't know if uh, Chinese students would like this, but <laughs> at least uh, during the uh, Three uh, Kingdom period, you see, the, this line is the Korea-Chinese Korea border, right? So during the Chinese, uh, Three Kingdom period, uh, the Koguryo expanded. I mean, it had land sort of expanding to uh, part of uh, China, right? Uh, so you see the name there, right? Koguryo. Uh, so the first religion to sort of, other than shamanism, to uh, make a, an impact on the religi religious landscape of Korea was Buddhism. And it became de facto state religion in unified Shilla. And that's uh, from 668 to 935 AD. Uh, so it, sort of not state religion per se, but at least officially sponsored. Uh, why do we know that? Because Shilla kings adopted Buddhist names and came to portray themselves as Buddhist kings. And this is when a large number of uh, te temples and statues were built, including uh, Purguksa and Sokuram. And these were financed by... so the. Temples at the time were built in large numbers 
and they were sponsored by or financed by high-ranking officials. Have you guys been to Purguksa and Sakuram? Well, foreign students, uh, these are some of the things you should go see because it's uh, designated as uh, UNESCO uh, World Cultural Heritage. And I hope you pick a right time. Because if you pick a wrong time, you know what I mean by wrong time? School trips from all over Korea. And you know, you have these thousands of kids running around. There is no way you could enjoy these in peace. Okay? Um, so this is Purguksa. Uh, And this is Sakura. Um, I think I should tell you in advance if you are planning to go. Because for me personally, I have, to be, I have to confess, when I saw it, I was a little bit disappointed. You know why? With all the pictures, before I went, I saw all these pictures, right? And without really looking at the dimension, the size, I expected something really big. But that is really tiny, small statue, right? So if you, know, if you go there knowing that now, you'll be impressed. Yeah? But maybe I went there when I was too young. Not having, you know, deep impression, imp because maybe things big were more impressive than, you know, anything else. Um, as a little kid, I don't know. Did, what, what was your question? It's, um, like the size of my upper torso, okay, all right. Is, that's about the right size, right? Oh, really? How could it be damaged? Because you cannot really touch. Last time I was there, I touched it, but just kidding. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. So am I right in saying it's about the size of my upper torso? Mm. Okay, uh, in the following Korea dynasty, uh, this is the dynasty before Joseon dynasty, right? So second last dynasty, uh, Buddhism uh, flourished even more, becoming a religion of the state. Now it became a, a state religion. So it received extensive privileges and financial support. And this was made possible by the founder of the dynasty, because the, the founder, Tejo, he believed that uh, Buddha was responsible for his political success. Okay? Because you know, founding of any dynasty involves what? A lot of killing and a lot of uh, conspiracies and so on, right? So becoming a uh, a king anywhere, we say, you sort of owe that to uh, uh, sort of uh, heaven's will. It's, it's just you trying hard doesn't mean that you, you know, somehow become a king. It takes a lot of, like, coincidences, a lot of uh, luck, and that luck tends to be determined by the heavens, right? And he became a, a staunch patron of uh, Buddhism, and he built uh, hundreds of uh, temples. In return, monks conducted elaborate state protection rit rituals. Uh, Buddhism also became a political force as it deeply involved itself with the ruling family and powerful members of the court. And, uh, you know, can you imagine this? You know, of course, this impossible now, but back then uh, temples became uh, influential centers, uh, complete with, uh, you know, tenants. It's, it was like a small castle where there were slaves even, okay? There were commercial uh, ventures and so on, okay? But uh, the government spending on uh, uh, Buddhist uh, temples became uh, excessive and monks, long enjoying extensive privileges, were involved in many types of corruption, including uh, those involving sex, right? So, 
what is that famous saying? Where there is absolute power, there is absolute corruption, right? So this is what happened to Buddhism back then. Buddhism was, was so powerful that it, it became corruptive. Okay? And during, so during the Korea dynasty, you know, the dynasty before the Joseon dynasty, Buddhism was state religion and it was corrupt uh, in two sense because it was heavily involved with politics and it, uh, you know, had a lot of social power uh, and, you know, it was not any different from any other large land-holding uh, rich uh, aristocrats, okay? So the, and then the uh, new, new dynasty was founded in 1392, uh, Joseon dynasty. And this is when uh, Neo-Confucianism was adopted as a ruling ideology. And this led to the suppression of Buddhism and Shamanism. Okay? And this is when many temples were destroyed or forcibly closed. And monks and nuns were forced to live in the mountains and were prohibited from entering towns. So before Joseon dynasty, if you had a, a monk in the family, it was a, a family glory, right? Like in the Middle Ages uh, in Europe, if you had a priest in the family, it was like, oh, my son is, you know. But this is when, now, now at this time, you know who became monks? Monks at this time were in the same class as outcasts, okay? Uh, almost like just a level above slaves. That's how the uh, status of monks have fallen to, okay? And uh, these re restrictions lasted until the 19th century. And it was during the Joseon dynasty that uh, Christianity was introduced. And the first one was Catholicism. And this happened in... Um, 1784. Okay? So... Um, so, there was a little bit of a background information there because what sort of uh, is dis distinguishing about the Joseon dynasty is that it sort of remained what is called Hermit Kingdom because it only had a limited contact with China. That was it. Okay? And, this, and that is when, uh, you know, Christianity was introduced. Uh, and how, that, how did that happen? The son of an ambassador to China was baptized while in, uh, in, in, in Beijing. And he returned to Korea with religious texts translated into Chinese. Okay? And then, you know, he taught what he read to his friends. Okay? And so, so this, this part is a very unique history of Christianity in Korea. I don't know if you know of any other country that has experienced this. So, 1784 is when this uh, son of an ambassador came back to Korea with religious texts translated into Chinese. Now, he proselytized <laughs> and shared what he knew about Catholicism to his friends until when? 1836. So for about 50 years, uh, Catholicism was practiced without a single Catholic priest. So this is not did they just learn about the, the Christian text, but they also held a mass. Okay? Uh, you know, they did almost everything uh, Catholics would do, just by themselves. Uh, and in 1880, 1836, we finally did have a, a, a priest come from uh, China. And, uh, but then hell broke loose. Okay? So even before 
the first Catholic priest arrived in Korea, there were a series of persecutions from 1791 to 1866, which resulted in uh, between about 8,000 to uh, 10,000 Catholics being executed. Okay? And, um, uh, well, you know why this, they were executed, right? Because by then, we're talking about 1784, uh, ancestor worship was required by every Korean to practice. Okay? Ancestor worship. Now, what is the Catholic teaching? No, not even Catholic, but Christian teaching. One of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not commit, no, I almost said adultery. <laughs> Thou shalt not, oh yeah, it is, it is commit something. Thou shalt not commit idolatry, right? So, ancestor worship at the time was seen by, Catholic, by the Catholic Church as a form of idolatry. Why? You're venerating your ancestor's spirits. You, you're praying to your ancestor's spirits. So, from the Catholic Church's standpoint, that is, you know, against one of the key Ten, ten Commandments, right? So, the Catholics who were martyred, they refused to perform ancestor worship because that's what the Church taught. That ancestor worship is a form of idolatry, so you should not practice ancestor worship. And they didn't. And that's why, uh, at the time, if you did not perform ancestor worship, that was punishable by death. And that's what happened. 8,000 to 10,000 Catholics. And 133 of them uh, later were canonized. Can you believe that uh, Korea has the sixth largest number of saints in the world? You know? And there are so many uh, Catholic countries, but Six high, uh, largest number. Uh, and then the introduction of uh, Protestant, Protestantism in Korea in 1884. So the, the years are really easy to remember, right? Uh, Catholicism was introduced in 1784. Uh, Protestantism 100 years later in 1884. And the first Protestant missionary to arrive in Korea was an American doctor. Okay? So... Uh, this is not uniquely Korean phenomenon. You know, in the uh, early, if you look at the early p missionary history, you find that uh, many doctors and nurses uh, were first sent because they knew that's the kind of a service that the people of the host society would, would be needing, right? So doctors, nurses, and teachers were usually the first, of, first group of uh, missionaries to go to a... Uh, a foreign land for uh, missionary purposes. Soon afterwards, other missionaries from the US, Canada, and England arrived. Religion during the Japanese colonial period, uh, religion, religious freedom was generally suppressed. So, uh, sort of, they, were, they sort of uh, didn't uh, welcome Christianity uh, because they feared the church could easily become a, a point of contact for many uh, Upi independence fighters or nationalists, right? Uh, because, you know, church has a weekly, you know, like a Sunday, you know, service. And also they have a, like a, a Bible study meeting. So it brings people together. What about Buddhism? As you know, there is no regular meeting. You only go when you need to go. Uh, there's no, you know, uh, sort of a scheduled sort of uh, meetings of, a, of any kind. So uh, the Japanese authorities were much, much more tolerant of Buddhism than, uh, than Christianity. And following the liberation in 1945 and subsequent division of Korea, many Christians in the communist north fled to the south. Because when communists took over North Korea, there were two groups of people there were, there, who were uh, targeted for uh, persecution slash prosecution. Capitalists, 
landlords and Christians. Because Christians, uh, this is something I need to tell you. When Korea was uh, liberated from Japan, a uh, large number, vast, you know, if you want to quantify proportion of Cor uh, Christians in the North and the South, more than two-thirds of Christians were found in the North. Okay? Even though South Korea had a you know, population that was twice as large. Before the division, Christianity was almost like a North Korean phenomenon. So this is a, also an interesting uh, thing, you know. Does religion prosper in places of hardship? Well, to that question, Korea provides a perfect answer. Why do you, you know, same missionaries, same efforts. Why were North Koreans more receptive to Christianity? Interesting question, right? Yes. Can you, uh, microphone please. Can you speak a little bit louder, please? Yeah. Just for clarification, you're saying that Christianity is the same as Catholicism. Oh, well. Oh, oh okay, okay. So I was confused as to what was what. Okay, so at times we could use them interchangeably. Uh, at times, I have to specify. So when I say that church was uh, sort of suppressed during the uh, Japanese colonial period, it applies to both, right? Uh, so I don't know when else I should talk about. So in here, it's, uh, it says Protestantism, right? So there, uh, when I say Christianity, it includes both. Okay? So... Okay, thank you for that. I'll, uh, in my future presentation, Christianity, comma, right? Both uh, uh, Protestantism and Catholicism, right? Thank you. Um, also, yeah, when I say many Christians in the Communist North fled to the North Korea, that includes both, right? And Christians who settled in the South were reportedly more than one million at the time. So I already made that point, right? That uh, majority, meaning more than half, uh, of Christians lived in the northern half of, of the peninsula. And again, I cannot emphasize this point enough, meaning at the time, South Korean population was twice that of the northern population, and yet there were more, uh, more Christians, including both Catholics and Protestants, living in the north. And... Um, now that I'm mentioning this, uh, wow, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a people-worthy, an article-worthy topic. Why? Right? I mean, I just mentioned one possible, possible factor, right? The studies find that religions become more prosperous at places of hardship, whether that's economic hardship, you know, social hardship, like discrimination and so on, right? So, um, anyway... So that's, uh, that's it. Before we take a break, yes? Um, is that still yes. And I'll show you a graph which, you know, sort of attests to that. Okay? So the, uh, the next uh, part uh, is about religious diversity in Korea. And um, so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, religion is still a... a vital force, uh, in very influential uh, force uh, in Korea. Uh, and religious population has increased steadily since the liberation in 1945. And um, uh, traditional religions, uh, including uh, Buddhism, and although the data doesn't, do, do not really show shamanism, they uh, still remain vi vibrant and a uh, new religion like Christianity uh, is still uh, uh, still has a very strong presence uh, in in Korea. 
So as everyone knows, Korea has no official religion, uh, nor is there one dominant religion. And this is a, an important point, because in many societies, you do have uh, one dominant religion, right? Or maybe, you know, one dominant and second dominant religion. But in Korea, it, you know, we really don't have any uh, sort of dominant religion like that. So we have uh, a situation in which there is a religious, uh, you know, peaceful religious coexistence, right? We have uh, Buddhism, Christianity, uh, and all, you know, types of new religions uh, not really, uh, you know, are in any conflict, right? And Confucianism is sort of... Uh, practice as a set of uh, moral precepts uh, but uh, anyway about 76,000 Koreans still identify C Confucianism as their religion and there are some 200 uh, Confucian shrines And according to the latest census in 2015, uh, Protestantism, Protestantism is now the largest religion with uh, 9.6 9 million followers, or nearly 20% of the uh, Korean population. Buddhism is the country's uh, second largest religion with uh, 7.6 uh, followers, 7.6 6 million followers. I think it's better to just show the table. Remember, uh, I showed you this before, right? Uh, so, uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's helpful to show this again so that you know, I guess, uh, more um, uh, clearly, you know, what the religious landscape in Korea looks like. So again, the most reliable source on religion is the census. And the latest one was done in 2015. And the largest religion is, uh, is Protestantism with uh, almost 10 million uh, followers, which is about 20% of the total population, followed by uh, Buddhism with uh, 7.6 million followers, uh, representing about 15% of the total population. And the third is uh, Catholicism with uh, nearly 4 million followers, uh, representing about 7.9 percent of the total population and remember that uh, Korea has one of the highest uh, proportion of the population with no religious religious affiliation and I'm finally finally writing a paper about this uh, and I've been saying this for the last 20 years and can you believe that no one no one has written about this yet uh, anyway um, so, in a pie graph, uh, really nice, <laughs> so uh, largest uh, pie belongs to, you know, people who say no religion or no religious affiliation, and, and I, am, I, am, I, am, I am also sure that you remember this, right? So in comparison to the world trend, Korea does stand out in terms of having such a large proportion of the population who profess no religious affiliation. So the world average is 16%, but Korea's average is over 56%. So that really is outstanding. And this is uh, uh, something, uh, I don't know if I showed you this before, but it's, it's worth showing this again. If you talk about religious diversity, uh, Asia Pacific is the only region or continent which says it's very high because you have Christianity, you have Mus uh, Islam, you have Hinduism, and you also have Buddhism, right? And also folk religion. Uh, and then you have a, a sub sub Saharan Africa which is designated as or classified as having high religious diversity because of two religions, right? Uh, Christianity and Islam. But the rest, 
uh, is low diversity, okay? Because it's usually one major religion or dominant religion, okay? And uh, this uh, similar question was raised uh, earlier. Uh, which national, nationalities consider religion most important? If you look at the top 10, can you think of any common characteristic? What would be the common characteristic of these countries which consider religion very important? Yes, very good. So, you wanted to say the same thing. And put it more bluntly, uh, yes, it's now politically incorrect to say poorer nations, but let's say developing nations tend to be more religious compared to wealthy countries except the United States. And you can see here, right? All the countries uh, here are developing countries where their religiosity is high but their income is low, right? And if you come here, we're talking about like countries in, in, North, in Europe and, and so on, which have a high income, but a low religiosity. But except the USA, okay? Uh, USA is an exception in this regard, okay? And um, just for your interest, I wanted to show you this because what's the proportion of Christ Christians in Korea? 29. We're talking about both Catholics and Protestants. But in North America, 71% of Koreans go to church. So this is a classic example of uh, how church has become an ethnic community center. Okay? Uh, but uh, the opposite is true for Buddhists, uh, because uh, to begin with, Buddhism does not have a, like a regular meeting like church, so that's a, this, this, that's a dis disadvantage. And uh, wh whereas churches are abundant, abundantly, abundantly, uh, you know, found uh, in many uh, cities where a lot of Koreans are found. You, that, the same cannot be said for uh, Buddhist temples, okay? Okay, the next uh, topic is, uh, or part, is the rise of Christianity, uh, religious and non-religious factors. And before I do that, I want to briefly talk about some of the facts about Christianity. Now, do you think this is a, a good candidate for your final exam? Yes or no? No response? If you say yes, I'll put it on your final exam. <laughs> Nobody said it, so I, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, facts about Car uh, Korean Protestantism. Uh, remember, it was introduced uh, to Korea in 1884. Largest religion uh, in Korea right now. And the growth has been particularly pronounced from the early 1960s to the end of the 1980s, like this. Uh, I mean, the numbers are not accurate, but you, you, get the, you get the drift, right? That it's really grew really, really fast. Like from the 1960s to the 1980s, it doubled every decade. You know what double means? One million, next decade, two million, next decade, four million. Next decade, 8 million. That's what happened. Okay? Uh, and Korea boasts some of the largest churches in the world. Uh, so Metropolitan Seoul is home to 23 of the 50 largest churches in the world. In fact, five of the ten churches, largest churches in the world, are found in Seoul. So here's this, you know, if you ever, if you wanna, if you ever wanna remember Seoul with certain nicknames, there are two. One, city of churches. Second, city of neon crosses. 
Okay, both related to Christianity. There are 170 denominations, some 70,000 churches, and more than 130,000 pastors. Do you think this uh, number of denominations sounds too many, or do you think that's about the same like in U USA? Uh, I think I could only say this. I could tell you this joke because I'm Korean. But if you weren't Korean, you'd be called racist. And here's a joke. You know why we don't have too many good ice hockey players? The answer goes like this. Every time they go into a corner, they set up a corner store. <laughs> Nobody's getting it. Um, this joke came about because uh, when Koreans immigrate to like countries like Australia, Canada, and the United States, the because they're uh, you know they're the the kinds of educational attainment they have or the training they have in in Korea are not recognized by the host societies. They can only do manual work, or if they have enough money, they set up a business, and typically. Their first business is convenience store, or, or uh, you know, put it on the. It's also called a store, right? So you get it. Hockey. I guess you don't know much about ice hockey. Uh, you know, to be a good player, you have to go into corners to dig, you know, uh, uh, you know, puck, right? Or to fight for for the puck and all that stuff, right? So every time they go into a corner, instead of playing hockey, they set up a store. That's the... Anyway, if you know the... Sorry for saying this. <laughs> uh, the reason I said it was because they also jokingly say, we have so many churches and so many denominations because every time there's a disagreement, they set up a new denomination. And every time there's a disagreement, they <laughs> separate and set up a new church. So, in fact, one of the reasons people say, the reason why Christianity succeeded so, you know, nicely in Korea, is that they broke off from each other so often. And when they did that, they had pews to fill. And that's why it made so many, you know, pastors and evangelists to work so hard to, uh, again, you know, attract uh, uh, new churchgoers, right? Anyway, uh, you know, uh, the number of Christians in the United States, for example, at least five times more. But the number of denominations there, far less than Korea's uh, total, okay? Korea is now, this is a very interesting uh, point. Korea is now the second largest missionary sending country in the world. Number one country is what? The number one missionary sending country in the world is? USA. Since it sent 46,000 missionaries worldwide. Korea. 27,000 missionaries. Okay. Isn't this amazing? Country with... Uh, what, some 130-year uh, history sends second largest number of missionaries uh, worldwide. I'm sure you have seen uh, a Korean missionary or two in your neighborhood before, you coming, before coming to Korea, no? Okay. Uh, Korea is, um, is the only country in all of Asia, except the Philippines, where Christianity has established as a major religion in, in uh, major religion and now this itself is impressive but if you compare this with what happened in Japan I, I don't know if I mentioned this before it's even more amazing um, the Japanese population is about 2.5 times larger than that of Korea the number of Christians in Korea about close to 30 million okay Number, not 30 million, right? 
about 24 million. Number of Christians in, in Japan, about 600,000, okay, representing about 0.5% uh, of the population. And the, the, the reason this compar comparison makes sense is because although Samuel Huntington somehow classified Japan as a, a separate uh, civilization, uh, you know, it is true that Japan and Korea do share a lot of cultural similarities, you know, like the uh, influence of Confucianism, influence of uh, Buddhism, uh, and so on, right? So, of, you know, the next uh, uh, natural question is, what are the factors which f facilitated the rise of Protestantism as the largest religion in South Korea today. Do you have any thoughts? What are the factors that made Koreans to accept Christianity or, you know, yes, yeah. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, just the uh, American presence, uh, especially after the war, uh, we had uh, you know over hundred thousand American soldiers uh, coming to Korea to fight and then staying for uh, at least a few more years. Okay, that's uh, a possibility. What else? This is a group religion. Hmm? This is a group religion. Group. Mm. Okay, uh, Christianity is a, a group religion, meaning it brings people together on a, on a regular basis, like for uh, Sunday service, uh, and also uh, like Bible study and all that, right? Um, I don't know if I have that particular aspect, uh, you know, uh, on the list, but uh, we'll see. Okay, it, uh, it creates a sense of community. Maybe adapting to Korean society, so including some Korean values, like, the, um, like including that um, instead of only the law, um, good life after death, okay. also um, health and a long life and um, monetary success, which are very important to Koreans. Okay, so. Uh, if you want to, if I had to put that in, uh, sort of put that differently, it would be affinity or congruence between Christian teachings and Korean values. Okay, so we'll uh, get into more specifics a little bit later. Yes. Yes. So that's sort of similar to what she, what, she, what she just said, but we'll see how that was sort of uh, artificially created in a way, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So, so to join the the whole modernization movement, and the the modernization was something that was uh, being sort of associated with Christianity, right? Um, so, anyway, let's, uh, well, very uh, good uh, responses. Um, and uh, here we go. Factors for the rise of Christianity in Korea. First one goes like this. So, if you sort of uh, um, look at uh, some of the theories related to how new religion becomes successful, one of the key factors is that it has to be sort of initially accepted okay so there's got to so you know if a new religion is 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 introduced and it meets strong opposition right from the start do you think it will have a chance of penetrating the 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 whole society 
not so good. So what happened in Korea was when Protestant missionaries arrived in 1884, Korea was in hell. Why? Because, I mean, I'm exaggerating, right? Uh, just a few years before, Japan forced open uh, Korea for trade. And when I say forced open, I mean it literally. Korea didn't want to do any trade with Japan, but Japan, you know, using superior arms, uh, f you know, sort of forced Korea to open its port for, for trade. Okay? Uh, and this is when, um, you know, like countries like China, Russia, Japan, all vied for sort of control or influence over Korea. And you can imagine how that created a, a very uh, powerful sense of trauma for, you know, the elite and also the masses, right? Uh, all of a sudden, you know, you have this fear that your sovereignty is in danger. And this is when the missionaries arrived in Korea. Okay? So, uh, so you know how all of these uh, happen then and later, right? So, uh, so I have a title as a sort of a subheading like National Traumas and the Hope for Sovereignty because uh, this, you know, for the first time in a long time, Korea felt threatened, okay? Now, of course, uh, throughout history, Korea maintained uh, sort of a stable relationship with China because Korea was a, a tributary state. That means we paid, we gave the Chinese court, you know, many, many gifts, including uh, in the form of a, you know, human gift, so that China does not attack Korea. Okay? So, you know, that's why we sort of felt safe for a, a long time. But all of a sudden, in the late 19th century, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Korea is a country and the people felt threatened that all of a sudden you have, uh, you know, uh, not only uh, the Japanese and, and, and Russians, but also Chinese now all of a sudden uh, sort of trying to uh, have more say in, in the affairs of, uh, of, of, the, of the peninsula, right? So, that is why uh, when the missionaries came, again, if you, if you read the annals or the history of missionary efforts all over the world, you find that the elite uh, is usually hesitant or, or hostile to missionary efforts. But the missionaries to Korea, believe it or not, the elite were either indifferent, but at least they were not hostile. Why? Because of what I just told you. Okay? So, uh, you know, a lot of things are related to timing. Uh, and I think uh, this really applies to Korean uh, situation. Okay? The timing of the arrival of the, the Western missionaries was simply impeccable. See, you know, uh, but the, the for, for Catholicism it was a little bit different, right? But at least for the Western Protestant missionaries, their timing was really, really good because Korea was uh, in danger of losing its city and the, the government wanted to court the favor of the governments which sent all these missionaries. We're talking about the United States, uh, England, Canada. That is why uh, after the opening of the Korean port to uh, Japanese uh, trade, Korea signed series of treaties with these countries, you know, US, England, uh, and so on, okay? So the, the first part is about the beginning, the auspicious beginning, okay? Because Korea was in trouble, Korea welcomed its, the missionaries. 
But if you look at what happened to the missionaries to Japan, to China, they all uh, experienced something totally different. You know, just hostility, uh, violence, but that practically never happened in Korea. Okay? Second is, these missionaries, uh, they provided services that were not otherwise available to Koreans, especially commoners, the uh, underprivileged. And I'm talking about these. They provided Western medical treatments. Okay? So, you know, you shouldn't think they was offered for free. Okay? They did charge, but if people came with no money, they still provided medical uh, treatment. Okay? And vaccination too. Uh, missionaries offer education for commoners and girls. Until, this, until the missionaries came, only who received education? The children of aristocrats, Yangban, right? Commoners and girls were not uh, offered, given any education. And they opened schools for the blind, deaf, okay? And believe it or not, until the missionaries offered Western style education, meaning science, mathematics. You know what Koreans were learning the whole time they were at school? Confucius classics. What Confucius said, that's all they learn. Believe it or not. Until the late 19th century, that's all they learn. Confucius, what Confucius said, what he meant, what he said, right? Um, in Westerner, uh, missionaries also introduced institutionalized philanthropy. And, and this is really important too, right? Until they set up orphanages, Korea didn't have any of its kind. Okay? So, so orphans were just like, you know, um, just, they were just roaming around, uh, had no place to go, uh, no place to take care of them, and so on. Okay? So that's why this is about how Koreans had this favorable perception of what Christianity is because of what the missionaries did. Okay? Third is an affinity between Christianity and traditional religious values of Korean culture. And is this possible naturally? Do you find that shamanism has certain affinity to Christianity and vice versa. What about connection between Confucianism and Christianity? Can you think of any? Uh, if you really study hard, you could find certain points of contact. But you must sort of add to that that if there was a even the smallest connection, it was the missionaries, it was the Korean preachers who emphasized it. Okay? So you always have to remember this. By themselves, it's very difficult to make the connection between shamanism and Christianity. You know, connection between Confucianism and Christianity. But the connections were emphasized by Western missionaries, Korean preachers, and Korean pastors saying you have nothing to lose by converting to Christianity. Why? Because just like shamanism, we have this and that. Just like Confucianism, we have that and this. Yes, you have your... Right. Right. Okay, that's a good point. Even from the beginning, uh, what the missionaries argued, you know, Christianity is like Confucianism. It says, you know, respect your parents. Because one of the Ten Commandments, what, what does it say? What does it say? It says, honor your parents. What's, what is more Confucian than that, right? 
So they sold that idea over and over, you know, honor your parents, right? There is that element in Ten Commandments, right? Right? Okay, so there is that. And the story of Ruth, how to, be, how to respect uh, mother-in-law, kind of, right? Uh, and, and there's also this. Now, this one is a little bit easy, right? The connection between Confucianism and uh, Christianity. Why? Not only, except for the ancestor worship part, honoring parents, you know, respecting, like, you know, parents-in-law and so on, so on, right? And also, you know, those family values, you can find so many verses from the Bible that say, yay, this is as good as Confucian, right? But how do you make connection between shamanism, which is somewhat more important to Koreans, and Christianity. And the connections were highlighted by the missionaries and Korean preachers and pastors. How did they make those connections? Yes. In the book it was mentioned that uh, like shamanism is very based on materialism. Right. It's like, oh, I preach my ancestors to get something in return, not just out of my good heart. Right. And a lot of people use Christianity for the same thing, that if they... Uh, Excellent. That's a, a perfect answer. You see, uh, pastors and preachers told Koreans, right, these suspecting Koreans, you know, Christian, Christianity can be as good as shamanism because now you have God, this omnipotent God who could answer your prayers. You pray to God and He will answer your prayers, right? And you know, if you look at the Bible, you can find so many, so many, so many verses that say, right? Again, that could support what the preachers or pastors wanted to say. That if you, you know, uh, so God was like a, a savior who grants material wishes. Again, of course, that's not what Christianity is about. You know, that's just a small part of Christianity. But in the Korean context, that's what they emphasized. Because they knew that's what would appeal to Koreans. Okay? And I already told you about the, the threefold blessings, right? So in addition to eternal life, health and long life, and prosperity. Okay? And this one, the full gospel church, uh, again, world's largest church with like 700,000 members. Okay? And because he became so successful, other churches have emulated, okay? And uh, even mainline uh, churches, you know, often do mention that, at least in passing, that God brings you, you know, good things, okay? And that is not supposed to be a, a, a central message of Christianity. Uh, in the West, the, the church, the denominations that sort of uh, emphasize this material thing is uh, Pentecostal. And Pentecostal uh, denomination is a small fraction of uh, the, the, you know, the churches in, in, in the West. But in Korea, we don't have that distinction. Even a mainline Presbyterian church would have a pastor saying something like, you know, believe in Jesus Christ or whatever, and you know, you'll, you know, he'll bring you prosperity. Okay? So that's sort of a, uh, not an issue really, uh, because it is so taken for granted. It's sort of a, uh, sort of a Korean thing in a way. It's sort of a cultural thing. Okay? Fourth is uh, uh, Christianity's association with th things modern. So uh, church, churches provided the basic tools of modernization like uh, modern education, technology, Western medical science. And Christianity assumed the central role in the economic, political, and cultural social modernization of South Korea. So uh, from uh, the liberation of Korea in 1945, uh, many uh, politicians, uh, like professors, and even businessmen, uh, you know, were educated in the USA and uh, they came back and they became uh, 
uh, like leaders uh, of or opinion makers uh, of uh, the country, and somehow people develop this uh, you know perception that yeah, you know being a Christian is cool. It's uh, you know you're you're sort of uh, joining. Uh, the, the, the modernization uh, wagon, uh, sort of. Um, I mean, if you really haven't lived through it, you won't understand this. Um, it's like, you know, uh, if you went to church, you sort of bragged about it kind of at school. Oh, you know, on Sunday I went to church, right? But you not say, about, say that about going to a, a temple, you know what I'm saying? So that's what happened in the 1970s, uh, at least, uh, in the 60s too. The last one is a really interesting one, and if you, think about whether you agree with this or not. Now, I wanted to show you this because what do you do? You see any pattern there? So the the purple shaded countries, in terms of the 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 depth, the darker it is, more intense, right? So. In the case of Christianity, real purple is like 90% Christians, okay? But uh, lighter uh, purple, 50 to 75% of the population being Christians, and so on, right? So you get the picture. Now, let's look at um, South America. When the, the Columbus and uh, Spaniards and, and, and Portuguese and, and you know, so on colonized South America. Who accompanied them? Missionaries. And when they went there, was there a powerful, powerfully organized world religion? No. Now let's move to Africa. When the missionaries or European countries colonized those African countries, were there powerfully organized religions? No. And when these countries were also uh, sort of became Islamic countries, were there any dominant religions which could oppose Islam? No. And what about now India? And if you ever th thought that missionaries never tried India, think again. Many thousands of missionaries went to India to convert them to Christianity. Nothing worked. Why? There was a powerful, organized religion which could oppose any effort by new religion. Now let's go to Japan. You know, we talked about just today, right? All these missionaries coming to Korea doing their missionary work. Did you know that given that Japan's population is even much, much larger, the number of missionaries sent to Japan were like five times larger than Korea. Nothing happened. Why? existence of powerfully organized religions, including Buddhism and Shinto. What about Korea? When the missionaries came, did we, did we have a powerful Buddhism? No, it was banned. Monks were all in the mountains. They were not playing any significant role. What about shamanism? It was practiced, although banned, but does it have a priesthood? Does it have a strong religious organization? No. You see the, the point I'm trying to make? So, and you could think about other examples too. Malaysia, Indonesia, where Islam is uh, the dominant religion, there too, they did not have a powerfully organized uh, traditional religion, which could oppose new religion penetrating their society. Okay? So, Korea is, a, is, a, is, is really unique. Why? If you think about, uh, you know, because Korea has a, 
long civilized sort of is a is a civilization with a long history. So because of what happened during the Chosun Dynasty, our Korea became a very fertile missionary ground because missionaries could not find a better place to, you know, penetrate because they go and there's no opposition. And it was like, oh my God, literally speaking. Because these missionaries, if you read missionary records, early missionaries, if you look at, if you read, if you, let's say you pick up 100 diaries of early di um, first missionaries to anywhere in the world, they all say what a difficult thing it was to actually even talk to the people of the whole society. But one exception is Korea. They all say, oh my God, literally speaking, oh my God, Korea looks like a country without religion. Because they just don't see anybody doing religion, practicing religion. Because the only time they did anything religious was when? Lunar New Year's Day, Chuseok, and for death anniversaries. That's it. But every, time, every other Sunday or every, whenever they look, they look everywhere, there's no practice of religion. So that's why this point is really interesting and very unique. Something to think about. Yes? Is that the reason why um, it's rather normal in Korea that people will come up to you and try to invite you to their church? Because, uh, like, I'm from Germany and there, there's only, like, one subgroup of Christianity who, like, will come door to door or try to like, mission, uh, um, use missionary methods. Whereas here in Korea, I will literally walk and people will start talking to me in English and going, do you have a religion? And if I reply with yes, they will say, is it Christian? And if I reply with no, they will say, no, well, well, we can try to change that, which is something that I've never experienced in that way, except for common people. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing to answer, because is that Korean? What do you guys think? Is that Korean? Or something about, uh, when I said, you know, churches have pews to fill. That is a, uh, not my original expression. But uh, you know how if you are faced with a desperate situation, you do desperate things. So we have all these church breakups and new churches being set up. And you have a pastor and you have a preacher you know, to survive, right? What do you have to do? You have to preach more. But, you know, the, the type that you're talking about is not necessarily related to that, because I, I myself have run into, you know, these, uh, what do you call them? These strangers. And also, uh, at some places, you know, when I go um, hiking, uh, usually the first person I see is this woman or man singing gospel uh, that I never heard of. But they, you know, and you have to ask yourself, what is the purpose of this? Because they're all just singing. You know, God is good, you know. And that's sometime, you know, in the subway, right? Yeah. And you also think about efficiency. Is the, is the message being, you know, being taken across and because of what he or she says on the subway or what he or she sings on, in the, on the street, does it have an impact? I think they need to take some class on management class. Uh, you know, efficiency, right? Uh, but anyway, I don't know if, there, if what you experienced is something Korean or uh, sort, of, uh, sort of idiosyncratic uh, uh, effort on the part of uh, some devout Christians, I don't know. Uh, but something to think about. <laughs> Okay, so I already uh, mentioned this. Okay, uh, next part is uh, uh, it's the last part before our discussion questions. Uh, continuing influence of religion. And tell me if you agree with uh, my observation that it is still, you know, whether religion in Korea is still really influential. Uh, so again, uh, in the West, uh, industrialization and urbanization are typically associated with 
increasing secularization, but Korea seems to be uh, an exception, right? Uh, so Korea experienced the rapid economic development and urbanization from the early 1960s to the end of the 1980s. Uh, however, religion shows no signs of losing its significance or influence or power. Okay? Now, a lot, of a lot of us do not realize how how many of you have always recognized uh, religious organizations as NGO? It is. And from now on, I hope you realize this, the most powerful NGO anywhere in the world is religious organization. Okay, whether it's church, whether it's a Buddhist organization, or Islamic organization, they are the most powerful and wealthiest, okay, uh, as a whole, as a, as a group, right? They are, uh, as a whole, major employer uh, in the country, and this is true everywhere uh, else. Uh, so we have uh, f over 41,000 Buddhist, bud Buddhist. <laughs> Buddhist monks, over 100,000 pastors, Nearly 2,000 priests. You know, uh, when I was uh, unmarried, um, so many uh, friends and relatives told me to become a priest. Because <laughs> I come from a Catholic family. Although I don't practice it anymore. But um, yes, the, the pressure was real. Um, and I got married rather late, when I was uh, like 35. And uh, I even had this encounter with my brother. Because when I got married at like age 35, it was when like men got married when they were like 27, 28, right? So I got married ri ri rather late. And one day, you know, my brother, you know, sits me down and he asks, Andrew, are you gay? <laughs> In all seriousness, because again, I was like seven, eight years behind uh, what Korean men typically do, right? Um, I don't know why I brought that up. <laughs> it was the whole <laughs> priest thing. Uh, before that, it was like, Andrew, why don't you become a priest? Um, anyway, um, religious organizations operate schools at all levels of education. Uh, this is also very amazing, right? Uh, about one-fifth of all colleges and universities are church-owned, mostly. A uh, few, you know, just a few, uh, owned by Buddhist organizations. Okay? So you guys are lucky that you guys are at Korea University. Whether you're a exchange student or regular student, same thing. If you go to uh, Yonsei, for example, you know what you're uh, subjected to? You have to go to a chapel service every week. Yeah. Every week. Can you believe that? So that's why I call every Yonsei student and uh, alumni, alumnus and professor fake intellectual. How could they let that happen? Again, whether you're Buddhist, you're Catholic or non-believer, you have to go. Yes. If you cannot graduate unless you go to a chapel service every week. Then am I right in saying they're fake intellectuals? And, and you can say, then why did you go to uh, Yonsei University? But then if you go to uh, Yonsei, if you check out the Yonsei website, do you ever see a cross there? Do you get a sense that it is a Christian university? No, they totally hide it. And on, when you show up for your first uh, like orientation, that's when they, ah, you know, <laughs> now you're a Christian, whether you like it or not. It's a, a total abuse of human rights, and, not, and I'm very surprised that nobody at Yonsei is doing, about, doing anything about this. Really. And to become a professor there, you know, you have to baptize, get baptized at a, a Christian church first. 
That's Yansei. So whether you had any romantic uh, idea about Yansei, think again. Okay? It's like a Rob Robertson University of, of, of the United States. I don't know why I brought that up. Robert. I don't know if there is a Robertson University. But uh, I meant to say something like a Christian university where, you know, in the U.S., Christian universities are very honest. You, you go to their website, the first thing, and I, you cannot miss it. The biggest symbol you see is the cross. The at Yonsei University website, you'll never see it anywhere, except maybe a department of theology. Okay? And they're maybe very small, right? No, I'm just kidding. I don't know <laughs> whether they have a cross there or not, but definitely at the main homepage, no. Okay? So are you guys happy that you guys are at Korea University? Very feel lucky that you, you guys are at uh, Korea University. Thank you. <laughs> OK, uh, these uh, religious organizations also operate hospitals. And you know, one of the top five uh, hospitals in Korea, Severance Hospital, right? That's uh, you know, owned by Yonsei University slash religious organization. They operate commercial enterprises like newspapers and printing houses. Uh, each of the three major religions, we're talking about Protestant Church, Catholic Church, Buddhist. They have their own uh, cable television network. Not just one. But look at Protestant. They have four. Okay? Uh, two for Buddhist and one Catholic. Uh, there are many, many more uh, Christians in the USA. Do you know how many? Uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm asking. Uh, in the USA, is there like a nationally broadcast cable television network for church? How many? How many? Ten. I'm talking about national. Okay, because I thought it was like one or two, but uh, since you mentioned ten. Okay, so this is nothing really, not, not that special then. I thought this was really <laughs> different, but USA has, has, has more. Uh, it does provide various social services, including uh, all these services. And one thing you should know is that... Uh, they're uh, typically sponsored by the government. Okay? So meaning, the government subs gives financial subsidies for these uh, welfare centers. And many times, often, not often, but uh, often enough, you, find, you know that, they're, that you find that they're run by church organizations or uh, Buddhist organizations. All right, discussion questions. So uh, thank you guys at uh, Beijing University. <laughs>